Uh, well, good morning and welcome to the Co Justice Committee's 25th meeting of 2017. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is a declaration of uh, interest. And here I'd like to welcome two new members to the Justice Committee, Maurice Corey and Liam Kerr. And can I ask first Maurice to declare any interest? I have no interest. No interest. And Liam? Uh, I have no interest to declare and refer members to my register of interests. That's, that's fine, thank you. Agenda item number two, decisions taken in private, which is five, six and seven. Item five and six are the consideration of the written evidence and potential witnesses for stage one scrutiny of the civil litigation, etc. bill and the offensive behaviour football, etc. repeal bill. Item seven is consideration of our forward work programme. And finally, under this item, we are being invited to take future Future consideration of draft of the draft one uh, of the draft stage one report on the domestic uh, abuse bill in private. Are we all agreed to take these items in private? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Right, moving straight on, the committee is um, agenda item three, public petitions. Committee is asked to consider and agree what action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to the petition, petitions. There are possible options uh, which are outlined in paragraph five of the clerk's paper. And I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk. And um, I remind members that if they do wish to keep a petition open, they should indicate, in, indicate how the committee should take it forward. And if they wish to close the petition, they should give reasons. The first petition is the Independent Inquiry into McGrackie Conviction Petition. It's discussed on page two of the clerk's paper. And I invite views from members on this petition. <coughs> Liam? Yes, thanks, uh, Convener. I think just consistent with the decision we took last time, we considered the position. I think Operation Sandwood um, continues, uh, and in light of that, I, I think uh, uh, we, we've got no option but to, to keep this open. I'm very happy right. to do that. Are we all agreed that we keep the petition open pending the completion of Operation Sandwood? Right, okay, thank you. And moving on now, Petition 1501 and Petition 1567, investigating unascertained deaths, suicides and fatal accidents. Um, these two petitions are discussed on three, pages three and four of the clerk's paper. Can I invite views uh, from members on both these petitions? Anyone like to kick off? I can give you a, uh, Stuart. Yeah. Um, it, it, just the, the I, th I think the content of both these petitions um, has run its course now. Um, I do note uh, the additional uh, contribution that we've had at Annex C from uh, a James Jones. I'm, I'm not, for my part, inclined to regard that as changing my view that we've now reached the point where we should close, close these petitions, but it would be worth just saying why uh, that's the case. Uh, it's basically because um, mandating something uh, in the past, which is essentially what's being asked for, um, ought not to be necessary. It's possible for an FAI to be uh, held in the circumstances that Mr Jones uh, is addressing, uh, but we don't need to uh, take any action here uh, for that to be the case, and I think the normal way in which uh, assessments would be made would be entirely proper. So I think that these uh, two petitions, which I think would be perfectly proper to be brought here, uh, have now run their course, and we should now uh, draw them to a conclusion. Yeah, there's certainly been quite a lot of correspondence between the current procurator Fisco and satisfactory answers seem to have been given to the petitioners. We've had no further uh, communication from the petitioner, only this third party, Mr Jones, who um, is maybe uh, moving off uh, the original petition ever so slightly. So is it the view of the, the committee that this is now the time to close that and has been satisfactorily dealt with? It is. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Right, moving on now to petitions PE 1510 and petition PE 1511, Police and Fire Control Rooms. These two petitions are discussed on page five and six of the clerk's paper. And again, I invite views from members. John Finney. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, I think in respect of the letter dated 31st August, then uh, the uh, author has strayed considerably from the uh, original intention with some um, gratuitous comments, I think, in there. But dealing, uh, and there's also some factual inaccuracy. So, so, for instance, in relation to paragraph four, it is actually the case that there's more middle management in Highlands and Islands than, than there was previously. <coughs> Excuse me. In relation to item seven, and I'm always interested to how morale is gauged because morale is a very personal thing rather than a collective thing. But also, there's comments about retirements. I think that's entirely in line with the, the profile of of the service and consistent ac across Scotland. The um, also following on from paragraph seven, there's also enhanced training in the islands. Um, what I would be happy to, to do is ask the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for their views on this, but I, I think it, it strays way beyond the initial lines of the petition. Yeah. That's, that's helpful, Liam. Just following on from, from John's comment, I, I, I certainly agree with his point about asking um, the SFRS for um, a response to, to the, the points made. I, perhaps um, they may want to limit themselves to the, 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 the points relating to the petition rather than specifically those in the letter, but we'd leave that open to them. I, I think also it, the, the letter, though, does raise um, issues that would be helpful to get a response from um, Scottish ministers to as well, and I would be supportive of inviting them to do the same and on the same basis. There's certainly a lot of issues raised. I think it's only fair that the, um, the, the service gets a chance to respond to, to these. Are we all of a mind then to keep these open? There's the added complication of the SPA still to uh, look at the, um, the interim arrangements for Inverness. So we all agreed that we keep both yes. petitions open and ask for these responses. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, I think that moves us on to agenda item number four. Do we have... Can we suspend briefly? Suspend briefly till we get the, the witnesses in for item four. Agenda item four is an evidence session with the Scottish Government Bill Team for Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. And I welcome Hamish Goodall from the Civil uh, Law and Legal System Division and Greg Walker, Solicitor Director for Legal Services. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and paper three, which is a private paper and ask Hamish to um, make a, an opening statement, please. Thank you, convener. Um, the bill uh, will deliver a manifesto commitment and increase access to justice by creating a more accessible, affordable and equitable civil justice system in, for Scotland. It will make the cost of civil action more predictable. It will increase the funding options for pursuers of civil actions, and it will introduce a greater level of equality to the funding relationship between pursuers and defenders in personal injury actions. The bill provides the legal framework to implement a number of key recommendations in Sheriff Principal James Taylor's 2013 review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland. Sheriff Principal Taylor made 85 recommendations, at least half of which, which will, will, will be taken forward in rules of court to be made by the Lord President on the recommendation of the Scottish Civil Justice Council. Some of Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations have already been implemented, such as those on sanction for counsel by the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014. Some of his recommendations on claims management companies and referral fees will be considered by the review of regulation of legal services, 
which is being led by Esther Robertson, the head of NHS 24. Uh, turning to the, the bill itself, part one of the bill uh, includes uh, legislative measures which will introduce sliding caps for success fee agreements. Success fee agreements are more commonly known as no win, no fee. So there will be sliding caps for success fee agreements in personal injury and other civil actions in order to make the costs of civil litigation more predictable. Uh, part one will also allow damages-based agreements to be enforceable by solicitors. Currently, damages-based agreements can only be used by claims management companies. Uh, but damages-based agreements will allow the solicitor's fee to be taken as a percentage of the damages awarded by the court or agreed between the parties. Section 8 of the bill introduces qualified one-way cost shifting, otherwise known as quocks. Uh, this is just for personal injury cases and appeals. Um, I better explain what qualified one-way cost shifting is because it's not really an easy concept. It's proposed that this will only apply in, in personal injury cases. The, the parties to a personal injury action are usually the, the pursuer is a private individual and the defender is an insurance company. Um, Sheriff Principal Taylor thought that there was an imbalance there, an inequality of arms between the pursuer and the defender. And one of the problems is that if the pursuer were to lose the action, they may become liable to pay the, def the defender's expenses. Now, in fact, Sheriff Principal Taylor pointed out that um, it only happens in England, it only happens in 0.1% of cases that the, the defender, if they are successful, will actually pursue the pursuer for their expenses. So he's therefore recommended that qualified one-way cost shifting should be introduced, whereby if the pursuer is unsuccessful, they will not become liable for the, the expenses of the defender. And the defender, as I've said, is usually a large insurance company. Uh, we will no doubt return to the subject of qualified one-way cost shifting later on. Um, later, uh, other parts to the bill um, make the auditor of the court of session, the auditor of the sheriff appeal court and sheriff court auditors salaried posts within, within the Scottish courts and tribunal service under a new statutory governance uh, framework. And finally, part four of the bill allows for the introduction for the very first time in Scotland of a class action procedure to be known as group procedure in Scotland. That's what's otherwise known as multi-party actions. Um, in general terms, the, the bill is designed to balance the needs of both pursuers and defenders in personal injury actions. The potential costs involved in civil court action can deter many people from pursuing legal action, even where they have a meritorious claim. The proposals in the bill for sliding caps on the amount that can be taken from an award of damages under success fee agreements uh, will mean that the cost of what the client has to pay his own lawyer is predictable. Success fee agreements, I should explain, include both speculative fee agreements and damages-based agreements. The proposals on quocks, qualified one-way cost shifting, in personal injury cases will protect the pursuer from paying the defender's expenses if the case is lost. Defenders, as I've said, are almost invariably well-resourced insurance company who rarely claim their expenses when they, are success when they successfully defend actions. The benefit will, however, be lost. The benefit of quacks will be lost to the pursuer if there is fraudulent or unreasonable behaviour or any other behaviour amounting to an abusive process. Um, we appreciate this is not easy stuff. <laughs> and um, we'd be very happy to answer questions.
Thank you very much. That's helpful just to have that um, brief introduction. Can I ask you at the very beginning, two of the recommendations come from the Gill Review. That was September 2009. The rest come from the Taylor Review, which was published in September 2013. Isn't there a danger this legislation is already and these recommendations are already out of date? Um, I, well, the proposals on uh, auditors of court and um, group proceedings, I think, that were not included in the court's reform bill uh, uh, be simply because that was already a huge bill. But um, the recommendations, I mean, there have been uh, proposals for group proceedings in Scotland for many, many years. The Scottish Law Commission, I think, looked at it about 20 years ago. So it, it's long overdue that, these, uh, that there is now provision being made for group proceedings. Um, it's simply been a, a case of um, finding a, the correct legislative vehicle to include these, these matters. Uh, as far as uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor's uh, review is concerned, um, I think there, there, there have been quite a lot of intervening pieces of legislation, such as uh, on the civil justice side, including the large courts reform bill and the bill on fatal accident inquiries, which you will remember, convener. Um, so there has, it's not as if we've been doing nothing. Um, there, there, there have been various pieces of legislation brought forward in, in, in the civil justice area. And this is now Sheriff Principal Taylor's um, review's turn. I suppose the question is then, have you gone back, looked at that legislation and compared it with the recommendations to see if there is something that isn't out of kilter now that new legislation's there, new procedures are in place? I think, uh, th th this legislation, do you mean the courts reform legislation? Anything that's happened in civil uh, litigation or legislation since then that might have impacted on these recommendations? That are before um, the, the, the Sheriff Principal Taylor's review grew out of the Gill Review and it was realised when the Gill Review was ongoing that... Um, the, the issue of expenses and funding of civil litigation was just simply too big an issue to be dealt with in the Gill Review, which is why it was dealt with separately by Sheriff Principal Taylor. So it was a, it was a, that was a conscious decision to take the two matters separately. So this is, this is completely separate from the, the court's reform agenda. Um, yeah. My point is more, um, uh, the law evolves over the years, and I, I suppose I'm just looking at the recommendations which have been taken and put into the bill, and what cognizance have been, has been taken of the changes that have happened during that interim period? Well, I mean, the, the, government, uh, um, the government consulted on these proposals in 2015, and we have been meeting uh, stakeholders since the beginning of the year, so we, th we think we're fairly well in tune with what stakeholders believe. I think okay. Greg wants to I would just add, Convener, to give you a concrete example of something we've added which goes beyond the Taylor Review. There's nothing in the Gill Report or Taylor Report about auditors of the Sheriff Appeal Court because that court didn't exist at the time. So there's something in the bill for that new Office of Auditor which has come in since the Courts Reform Bill. So hopefully that's just an illustration that we are looking at these reports critically in 2017 to come up with a bill that's fit for the justice landscape now. Okay, thank you for that. In terms of access to judges, which is the main um, objective of the bill, um, the Scottish Government, um, I really to ask what the Scottish Government thinks the practical effects of the bill will be on lawyers and the court system, and particularly in view of the criticism that it could lead to a compensation culture? Um, so far as um, lawyers and the court system is concerned, um, um, the bill will permit uh, solicitors to offer damages-based agreements. Uh, so that, that will actually increase competition among solicitors. Uh, so, uh, as far as the court um, system is concerned, the, the advent of group proceedings should have a beneficial effect because it will mean that instead of a large number of similar cases being dealt with separately, there will be the possibility for them to be dealt with uh, in one, 
one action, one group proceedings. So there should be economies um, for the court system in that. But, I mean, the, the thrust of the bill is more access to justice for people who have a claim and are concerned, firstly, about what it's going to cost them in terms of what they're going to have to pay their own lawyer, and secondly, if the case were to be lost, what they might have to pay to the, opposite, the, the other side if the other side wins. Yeah, I think there are more in-depth questions which other members may want to pursue. Liam, you have a, a supplementary. Yeah, thanks, Camille. Just following up the, the earlier point you made about um, the time that's elapsed between the, 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 the report and the recommendations from Sheriff Taylor um, and, and now the, and in the presentation of the bill, as well as the, the point the convener's just touched on in relation to compensation culture. So I understand that Sheriff Taylor, in, in making the recommendations, drew on um, uh, figures from DWP suggesting personal injuries claims in Scotland um, between uh, 2008 and 11 had arisen by about 7%. The figure uh, south of the border uh, was around 23%. But the, between 2011 and 2016, the number of personal injury claims in Scotland has more than doubled to 16%, while the, the figure south of the border um, has uh, reduced to uh, around about 4%. I'm just wondering what assessment's been made. That, to me, doesn't suggest that there is a, a, an issue in relation to access to justice around personal injury uh, claims. It also suggests that the legislation brought in south of the border um, under the Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment and Offenders Act may have had some bearing on the number of claims coming forward. And I was wondering what assessment has been carried out by the Scottish Government into the way in which that legislation is, is impacting um, uh, south the, of the border. The English system is, is completely different. I mean, we, we are implementing Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations. Uh, Data that seems to me to be rather out of date. Well, Sheriff Principal Taylor didn't, didn't think there was a compensation culture in Scotland as, as he thought existed in England. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, if I can quote you, the, in 2015-16, in there were 8,766 personal injury actions raised in Scotland. Now, only 99 of those were legally aided. The rest of them, the vast majority of the rest of them, were, must have been funded by some kind of success fee agreement. So we're just building on, this bill will build on the popularity of using that kind of funding mechanism to enable people to take forward uh, cases which they may be, I mean, you may not be li liable for legal aid and therefore you need some other means to be able to take your case forward. Um, Sheriff Principal Taylor thought there was an excluded middle who might not be uh, liable for legal aid and might therefore not be taking forward. Um, uh, as a result of that success that you just talk about in terms of um, success fees, I mean, it suggests that the, the, the figures I quoted earlier on of a, a jump in from 7% during the 2008 to 2011 period to 16% between 2011 and 16, would suggest that that it seems to be working relatively well. And there's a question as to whether or not you want to accelerate that by making further changes. The evidence before Sheriff Taylor, um, I, I, I don't doubt, um, did not point to a compensation culture as appeared to exist south of the border. What I'm saying is since then, there appears to have been a dramatic reduction in the rate of increase of cases south of the border, um, but a doubling um, of the uh, increase in the, in the number of cases uh, in Scotland which does beg the question is that do the recommendations still stand and what assessment has the Scottish Government done of the relevance of those recommendations now as opposed to the point where they were made? Well, we, as I say, we have uh, spoken to various stakeholders and um, we, we don't, um, if, the, if there has been an increase in uh, the number of claims, it's not something that's really been raised with us, has it? No. Supplementary. Um, Thank you, Convener. I may have picked you up wrong, Mr Goodall, and, and if I have, uh, forgive me. You, you, you quoted some figures and you said 99% were... Sorry, I mean, 90, 99 cases, I mean, 99 yes. cases, yes. Um, ...were legally aided. Yes. And then, can you tell me how you described the others, please, again? Well, on the basis that we assume very few people have the personal <laughs> finance, financial uh, resources to uh, be able to finance a case themselves, we assume 
that all of the, uh, most of the other cases have been funded either by speculative fee agreements with solicitors or by damages-based agreements through claims management companies. Does that not discount the significant role that trade unions and staff associations play in relation Oh, yes. To well, yes, indeed. Some of them may, may have been uh, assisted by trade unions as well. Okay, thank you very much. Liam, can yeah. Does it not slightly concern you that, um, it just in, in the answers that you've just given to Mr. MacArthur and Mr. Finney, um, you talked about there that uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor thought there was thought that there was an excluded middle. You talked about they must be funded by this particular arrangement, and you assume uh, that there are very few people can fund it, and you assume that they were, they were running under speculative fee agreements or others. Uh, does it not concern you that uh, you're not able to say this is the situation and this is the objective data upon which we've based the legislation? Well, um, I, I may, have used, <laughs> may have used the wrong language there. I mean, th these are the conclusions which Sheriff Principal Taylor came to in his review, and his review took two and a half years. But based on data from about ten years ago? Well, um, uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor, I'm assuming, will be giving evidence to the committee, so... Um, We're in front of the, the Bulls team today. We'll have the Minister mm. maybe to, to account for why he still mm. thinks it's good to go ahead for the Bill, but few questions. Anything else you'd like to ask, Mr Goodall? Hi. Sorry, the, the, we, also, we also have produced a, a business and regulatory impact assessment for the Bill, which... Uh, so. Okay, thank you for that. Could I ask about um, claims management companies and why the bill doesn't regulate these? Um, that is simply because the review of regulation of legal services, which was announced in April, will be considering the regulation of claims management companies. Yeah, it may be more policy again, but maybe you can provide some some information. There's a real um, fear that in the interim, when there's um, stricter regulation has been since 2007 in England and Wales, there might be a, a displacement of claims companies coming to Scotland, and I suppose that's building into the the um, claim culture type um, fears. Was that looked at at all as part of the bill? Um, well, the, the review, as I understand it, is to report uh, a year from now, and the, the, re the review will be followed by legislation. So if there is a gap, I would hope it would not be a very long gap. Um, a lot of the... Um, we have heard that because, as you say, some of the English claims management companies are moving uh, to do business in Scotland because of the stricter financial regime down south of the border. Um, so, but they will still be subject to the UK regulation. So um, uh, there, will be, there may be a gap, but I think it will be a short one. Yeah, I think it's as much as you can answer, but, you know, 2007, we're now in, that's 10 years they've had the opportunity to move to a much more relaxed re regime. But again, it's more policy. Mm -hmm. And can I finally just ask you from the questions I wanted to pursue about successful fee agreements? Um, they're based on fee uplift and are subject to general regulation under the bill provisions when they appear to be operating satisfactorily and according to the market without the regulation. So the thinking behind that? No, that, that is correct. Um, speculative fee agreements have been in place for, I think, just over 20 years. Um, but all that the bill is doing in relation to speculative fee agreements is that the, 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 the success fee will be capped in the same way that a damages-based agreement success fee will be capped. Share Principal Taylor devoted separate chapters to speculative fee agreements and damages-based agreements in his review, but he came to the same conclusions in relation to both of them, which was that the success fee should be capped so that the cost of civil litigation should become more predictable to the clients. Okay, Liam, another um, supplement? Top point for yourself, thanks. Okay. 
John. Oh, sorry, Rona, you're doing this. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. If I could just um, follow up on what you were saying about capping of success fee agreements. Um, can you share with us at the moment any more details about, um, you know, when this, the full information on that will be available? Um, I think it's set out in the policy memorandum that our, in, our current intention is that we will go with the levels of caps which Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended. Um, but those caps will be set out in regulations which will follow the bill. And the idea of that is that if, it's put, if, they're put, if the caps are put into regulations, then they can be amended up or down, mm -hmm. depending upon um, experience. So the, the regulations will follow the bill. Okay. I'll just add, those would be affirmative regulations, yes. so this committee uh -huh. would have the opportunity to debate That's, and vote on them. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, can I also ask whether you think that there's a risk that the bill might make it uneconomical for solicitors to offer some services on a no win, no fee basis? Would they back off from some cases, do you think? Um, I'm not sure why that, that, that would be the case. I mean, uh, in personal injury actions, the, under the provisions of the bill, the solicitor, the successful pursuer solicitor will be able to claim uh, recover expenses from the losing side, they will also get the success fee. So the, the, they're, they're, they're getting two, two bits of payment. Mm -hmm. Balanced against that, however, is the fact that they will be liable for all of the outlays that are paid out in the course of the action. So mm -hmm. if they have taken the decision to engage counsel, for example, they'll have to pay for that. And if they've had to get a, a, an expert opinion, that will also have to be paid as part of the outlays. But I do, we don't see that um, this is likely to um, make it um, less economical for mm -hmm. solicitors. In fact, uh, I think Sheriff Principal Taylor at some point in his review said that he thought that uh, they should still get a good return from mm -hmm. raising these sure actions. Sure they will, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> can I also ask you... Sorry. Yeah, just on the risk factor, um, I think in one of the submissions they pointed to the fees far outweighing the compensation and expenses. So would that not be the element of risk that a solicitor would have? The, to, sorry, the to fees up? would. The, the solicitor, what had been incurred in fees. Um, we have raised that issue with um, various bodies, and um, one of the comments that was made was that. Basically, the, the solicitor is the, is the gatekeeper to the system of personal injury litigation. If as, uh, his or her professional judgment is that he needs to, they need to employ counsel or get an expert opinion, then that is what they will do. If at the end of the day, something strange goes wrong in the case and due to I don't know, contributory negligence, or perhaps it's discovered there's a, that there's a pre-existing condition and the, the damages awarded are not what was expected, then um, I'm afraid uh, someone said to us, that's just the fortunes of war. And one big firm said they would simply, uh, they would simply absorb that, uh, that loss. Okay, but it is, it is just the fortunes of war, and that's the, you know, that's the professional risk. Okay. Again, more policy once we, we get into that a little bit further. Sorry, Rana. Okay. Um, yeah, do you, can I ask if you think that um, damage-based agreements will become the norm if this bill's passed, and, and whether you think there'll still be a role for other forms of uh, success fee agreements? Um, I suspect damages-based agreements will become more and more popular simply because of their simplicity. But some firms of solicitors undoubtedly will have a business model where they prefer to go with speculative fee agreements uh, based on uplift of fees. So um, that, but that's a matter for them. Okay. Can I just move on um, to the issue of compensation for future loss, um, where, you know, obviously it's speculative as to care costs and lost earnings and things like that. Um, do you think that that compensation should be entirely excluded from the success fee calculation, given the importance of the award generally to the pursuers? 
um, tailor specific um, that, that that is what has happened in England. But Sheriff Principal Taylor specifically rejected that um, that view. Um, under the provisions of the bill, if the future element of damages is um, to be paid as a periodical payment order, then that will automatically be excluded from the calculation of the success fee. If the future element of the damages is to be paid in a lump sum, um, Sheriff Principal Taylor's got quite a lot to say on that. Um, he thought that if the, if the damages were under uh, about half a million, he thought that it was unlikely that there would be intended to be a future element in the, in the damages payment. If it's above half a million, under the provisions on um, success fees, the cap on success fees, it would only be 2.5%, which is payable as, as part of the, as, as the success fee on that element of the award. Um, but there are further safeguards in section 6, uh, subsections 5 and 6, as to uh, what happens when the, the the future element is to be paid as a lump sum. And there are, uh, the safeguards are that um, uh, if it's been awarded by a court, then the court must, be, must agree that it should be awarded as a lump sum rather than periodical pay, a periodical payment. Or if it's part of a settlement, then the matter should be referred to an actuary. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just briefly, do you consider that there's a risk of inflation of court awards uh, as a result of these uh, sorts of funding arrangements, uh, such that if, if a court knows that X pound represents the appropriate level of uh, damages, should we say, uh, to the pursuer, uh, but the court also knows that, say, 20% is going to be taken away by the solicitor or the representative, is there a risk that the court over awards such that the pursuer gets the full entitlement uh, for their future loss and, and for their current loss? Um, I don't think that is a risk because as I've said, if the award is over half a million, the success, the, the cap will be two and a half percent. So it's not really a very big, it wouldn't be, it's a, a very small proportion. But I mean, uh, solicitor, uh, the court will award damages based on the law of damages, it won't be based on the law of expenses. But then the court will also know that a proportion of the appropriate damages will be taken off the pursuer, yeah. don't they? I don't think a court would, would consider that, would they? I, I... You know, as my colleague said, the court is required to award damages based on the compensatory principle. Also, as Hamish has said, success fee agreements in one form or another aren't new. So if that's a risk, it's not a new risk. But I don't think Sheriff Principal Taylor identified any evidence or likelihood of risk that that would happen. Okay. Just two short questions left for me. Um, the, you talked about the half a million. Do you ever see that being expanded, protection being expanded to above half a million? Do you think that's likely? Um, we would be very interested to hear what evidence is given to the committee, um, particularly by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Um, so, you know, okay. we, we're quite open to okay. that. And sorry. just one other one. Um, you, sorry. I was just going to add that in the section six, the figures in there can be amended by affirmative regulations. Yes. Oh, right. So in the so years ahead, there would be some eight. flexibility. It's not set in stone. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the actuary. Um, can you give me an indication on who would pay for that advice from the actuary? Uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended that it would be the solicitor paid for the actuary, so that would be one of the outlays. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, John Finney. All oh, right, yes, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, um, I don't know if I can get used to this quarks at all, but the qualified one-way shifting, uh, cost shifting, Mr Goodall, um, when it was introduced in England, it was accompanied by measures to discourage spurious claims. Is there any intention to... Yeah, there, similar arrangement in Scotland. We have, there are um, we have, there are four factors which we think will um, mitigate against spurious claims in Scotland. The first is that, as Sheriff Principal Taylor has pointed out in his review, um, it's not worth a solicitor taking running a case on a no-win, no-fee basis 
if there's not a good chance that it's actually going to win. So if it's not, if it's not, uh, if it's an unmeritorious case, they're not going to run with that because they're simply not going to get paid. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, as I mentioned already, claims management companies um, are to be the subject of um, uh, consideration by the review of regulation of legal services. So we suspect that they're likely to become regulated in the future and therefore there will be some provision that will say that they should not run uh, actions which uh, have little chance of success. The third factor is there was a new compulsory pre-action protocol introduced into the Sheriff Court last November for personal injury actions of less than £25,000. Now, the effect of a pre-action protocol is that um, it front loads the whole process, so it should become apparent at a very early stage if a case does not actually have merit. And the fourth and last um, factor is uh, what is in section 8.4 of the bill, which are the circumstances in which the benefit of quarks may be lost. And it's basically if there is fraudulent or unreasonable behaviour otherwise, or which are, are, uh, amounts to a, an abusive process. Okay, can I ask you, Mr. Goodall, about the, the term unreasonable, because one of the submissions that we've, we've received in response to the consultation suggests that the level of unreasonableness described in this subsection, that's subsection 8, subsection 4, subsection B, um, is less than the Wednesbury uh, unreasonable test recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Is that the case? Um, we think what is in the bill is tantamount to or analogous to the Wednesbury test. Um, we have had a lot of discussions with stakeholders about this provision. You possibly won't be surprised to hear that the, those who represent insurers think that the test is already too high and those who represent pursuers think the test isn't high enough. Uh, so therefore we think it maybe is about right. But uh, we certainly think there is possibly uh, some clarification and uh, around, needed around um, Section 8.4. Okay, thank so you. So we, we will be listening with interest to what uh, stakeholders, uh, witnesses uh, say to the committee. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, uh, the, the, the Scottish Government considered limiting the benefit of quarks to situations where the defender is insured or a public body. Yes, that, I think the Faculty of Advocates has given evidence uh, to that. Um, that. That's something that we, c we can have a look at and again listen to what evidence is, uh, is. Because it would be quite harsh if an uninsured person who does not have the benefit of an insurance company behind them, if they... Um, if, if the, 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 it would mean that they, you know, they would not have the benefit. Well, they wouldn't have the benefit of quarks. So, it would, it, but we can look at that in future. Okay, thank you. The, the final question I have, I think others have questions in this section, is whether the Scottish government intends to implement the changes to the tender process that was recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Um, I, I would defer to my legal friend here, um, but I understand that the law, most of the law of, tend, of tendering is in the common law, and what isn't in the common law is in uh, uh, subordinate legislation. It's not in primary legislation, so that's why it's not in the bill. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, the language is quite confusing here, but tender is really an offer in the course of proceedings to settle a formal offer. Um, as Hamish has said, it's largely common law, but there, it's possible for acts of sedent rules of court to modify the process, and that can be done by the Scottish Civil Justice Council. And a recent example of that is pursuers' offers, which were reintroduced to Scottish practice by act of sedent. So the general principle is that this sort of thing would be for rules. We've got in section eight, um, six, that quarks qualified one way cost shifting is subject to any further fine details that might be in rules. So we're essentially proposing that the key policy things are in the section 84 you've mentioned, unreasonable behaviour, fraudulent behaviour. However, the fine detail of interaction with other rules of court and tenders in particular, that would be in rules of court under section 86. 
And as I think we may have put in the policy memorandum, it was certainly in the SPICE briefing, it's the Cost and Funding Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council that's looking at this field. Okay, many thanks indeed. Okay. Uh, there were a number of members indicated the supplementaries, Liam MacArthur, Stuart Stevenson, then Liam Kyer. Thanks very much, uh, Committee. Just following up um, John Finney's line of questioning, in terms of the, the, the safeguards you were outlining there, again, we return to the point around um, the, the lack of regulation of claims management companies that, that exists in this bill. But I think I heard you rightly um, suggesting that you were anticipating this coming through the review that's underway. I mean, that, to me, rather suggests that there's a recognition um, that that sort of regulation is needed, which I think begs the question, why, given the time that's elapsed since Sheriff Taylor's report, steps weren't taken to, to, to uh, include this in the, in the bill, go out to consultation as appropriate and, and include provisions of that nature in the bill. Would you not accept that that's a, realist, well, a, a reasonable conclusion to draw from what you've said? Well, um, Sheriff, the starting point is that Sheriff Principal Taylor didn't actually think there were, there were the claims management companies in Scotland caused a difficulty uh, at, his, at the time of his review. So, uh, but um, I, I mean, why it's not in the bill is because the matter is being considered the, the whole range of um, regulation of legal services in Scotland is being considered in the review being taken forward by Esther Roberton. So it seems more appropriate that it should be considered in that context. I think again that that's probably something probably, yeah. that no. is a policy uh, decision I, for the Minister. I appreciate that. I, mean, I think we may need to come back to it with the Minister because I think um, early indication of, of the government's likely intentions there may stave off some of the concerns that have been coming through in the written submissions, but I appreciate that's not something for uh, officials to address. Again, uh, earlier on you were talking about... Um, Section for QOCS. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it, was, it was in relation to um, the, the point you made earlier about um, the, the, the number or the proportion of um, cases where um, defenders would pursue the pursuer for yeah. legal costs, and it was, I mean, it was a, it was a fraction of one percent. I, I yes. think I heard you saying. Does that not open up the question as to why there seemed to be a problem that needs to be addressed here? That um, if those are the, the, the figures, then as a disincentive in pursuing a, a valid case or claim, and um, there doesn't seem to be evidence to suggest that, that, that because of that threat that you're going to be pursued for, for the uh, defender's legal costs, you, you'd hold off making a claim? Well, but, you know, the pursuer may, may not know that. Um, yeah, but the claims management companies would, and the solicitors that, that, um, that act in this area would certainly know those figures or have a, a, a general sense of those sorts of things. Well, figures. you know, the Cox has been um, in place in England and Wales for some time, so um, Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendation that we should also have it in Scotland. Right. Okay. Just finally, in relation to the financial memorandum, you were you were talking about um, the again in relation to the safeguards uh, running alongside uh, quarks. You were talking about the uh, the, the the unlikelihood of of, um, sort of vexatious speculative cases being being brought or being triaged out at an, at an early stage. But I, I note from the financial memorandum in, in paragraph uh, 59. It said, um, defenders will have to balance the cost of going to court with the risk of losing a case. For example, if expenses in a case exceed the expected payout, insurers may settle rather than go to court, even if they consider it likely that they will be successful in the case, which does seem to go against what you've said and goes against what's then set out in paragraph 50, uh, which suggests <laughs> that pursuers are unlikely to raise actions with little prospect of success and the bill provides protections for defenders where the pursuers have acted inappropriately. I, I'm finding it difficult to square those two, um, th th those two statements within the, well, right next to each other within the, the financial memorandum. Sorry, what, what, what paragraph? Paragraph 59 in the financial memorandum, and then paragraph 60. It doesn't quantify what the likelihood is of, of those numbers of cases where, um, where uh, defenders may just decide to pay out, but it does suggest there's a recognition that that risk certainly exists and that even where 
defenders are, are, are confident of being successful in the case, they will choose to, to pay out rather than to proceed through, through a court process. I think this is maybe a matter that uh, you would really need to raise with um, the uh, minister. Well, okay. not only minister, but also um, the, I'm sure you'll be taking evidence from uh, representatives of uh, pursuers and defenders. So, see what they say. Yeah, although I mean, I, I take that point. Although this is the, the government's financial memorandum mm -hmm. for it, its bill, so in a sense, it's 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 the government that's mm -hmm. stating mm -hmm. this rather than um, those either acting for pursuers or defenders. I think the only point I would add is, you know, there are weak cases, there are very strong cases, and there's the ones in the middle. So perhaps that's how the paragraph 59 is to be read. It's not about def defenders feeling boxed into settling a, what they think is a very weak case. You know, there are these ones in the middle. Okay. Okay. Fine. Stuart Stevenson. Um, where's the definition for what is personal injury? Uh, I don't see it in the bill, so I assume it's elsewhere. It is in here, if you give me a second. <laughs> All right, OK. Um, section 6.9. That's fine. If it's there, that's fine. And I, it. I think we've put in the expansion notes, it's the same definition that applies to the personal injury courts. So we're not creating a, a new right. definition. Right, OK. Move on to something a bit more uh, substantial. The, the, the assumption is that uh, Quox is about uh, rebalancing power. Uh, between uh, a well-endowed defender and uh, a Im relatively impoverished pursuer. Uh, let me just posit an example. Um, there is a cyclist in a cycle lane. To the left of the cycle lane is a wall, which the lane is against. A Rolls-Royce draws up. The passenger, who's a half-billionaire, opens the rear door into the path of the cyclist. The cyclist has no option but to hit the door and in the process to injure the half billionaire. The cyclist is a professional person, age 55, with a house worth three quarters of a million pounds in Edinburgh. They've not paid off their mortgage. They're running down their career, so they're working part time. They have an income of 40,000 a year. They're in that middle ground. Each, it would seem, may have a case against each other. And there may be two cases, because the multi-billionaire may have experienced permanent physical damage as a result of the cyclist, and the cyclist may have similarly. Do each have the ability to benefit from quarks, given that in the case of the multi-millionaire, uh, they have, for legal purposes, unlimited resources to pursue a case and recover their legal costs if they win, which they might do. Uh, and the cyclist is uninsured. <laughs> well, who, who is the pursuer? The pursuer well, would both be are. the cyclist. There are two cases. The cyclist is suing the multi-billionaire for opening the door and injuring him. The multi-billionaire is suing the cyclist because so the design of the cycle yeah. created particular injuries of the multi-billionaire that were not... Uh, that were not reasonable. Well, it sounds a rather fanciful <laughs> example, I would have to say, but, um, you know, the, the, well, the, the way the bill is, is stated is the pursuer will have the benefit of quarks unless they have behaved, behaved inappropriately. Yeah, so, fraudulent, unreasonable, or abuse yeah, of court, uh -huh. which I, I'm assuming would not apply in either of these cases. It depends on the facts and circumstances. I think it's very difficult for us to address such a detailed scenario. Well, I'm just, I'm making the general point, and, you know, let's not labour it because we're merely looking at the construction of the bill. Uh, the general point is that the assumption that the defender will be the wealthy one and the pursuer will be the impoverished one is surely one that is not sustainable in all circumstances. It actually may be the opposite. Is that a fair comment that you've considered in constructing the bill. In trying to understand this, is, is it a case that there's a pursuer in the person that brings the claim first and they would be the beneficiary, the person that was the counter claim wouldn't mm. have the same rights? Yeah, yeah. Is that the, the case? To, the narrow point about 
rich um, pursuer, poor defender. I think that's linked to the point that's already been made about is the bill team going to consider the application of quarks to uninsured persons? The answer is yes. Um, but, you know, as I also, as I said earlier, the very fine detail can be left to rules of court. If the Parliament, if this committee believes the finest detail needs in the face of the bill, then that's something we'll consider. So, so just to close it off without going too far, it is, it is reasonable for us to consider that that particular kind of case can be dealt with under rules of court. You, that's what you were saying in terms of, you know, how things can work. Absolutely, but I think, you know, that sort of case where there's detailed counterclaims and so on, we're legislating for the standard pursuer defense. I may case. have made it more complex than I should. The, the, the basic point is that where there's a wealthy pursuer and an impoverished and uninsured defender, uh, but who's asset rich and therefore worth pursuing. <clears throat> that's on the official's radar. Yes, that, that's the, the point that the faculty... I mean, have income advocated. poor but asset rich, you know, is really... The, uh, but uninsured. Yeah, well, that's the point the Faculty of Advocates has raised about where, you know, the, the defender may be uninsured and may not be a public body, so we can consider... But the bottom line is there is a way forward in the legislative process in the round, not just the bill, that deals with that. Yes. Well, okay. I think Stuart Stephen makes a good point, but as always when we're passing legislation, then it's never totally satisfactory that so many questions are left to um, other guidelines. And yeah, some, some bad cases make bad law. <laughs> okay. L Liam Kerr? Uh, thank you, Convener. Just uh, very briefly, um, Mr. Goodall, you said uh, there were four reasons why there wouldn't be a rise in unmeritorious claims. Uh, the first of which uh, you said that the solicitor operating under a no-win, no-fee agreement uh, has no incentive to take forward an unmeritorious claim because they're unlikely to get paid at the end. Uh, but do you, which, which stacks up, I accept the point, uh, but isn't it open for the no-win, no-fee solicitor to insure against that loss such that the solicitor gets paid anyway. Maybe more than sure. I think so. Yeah. Um, so after These are questions you can put to the representatives that come before you. The, none of the claims management companies or funding companies, as they're sometimes described, work in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. They are private business arrangements, the full details haven't been put to us because they're commercially confidential, but you can ask these questions of the other witnesses. Uh, that may be more appropriate, but uh, it, it just it feels like uh, that's something that the legislation ought to have taken account of, because the, the point was put that there, there could well be a rise in unmeritorious claims, and I would suggest that a funding arrangement like that, which does go on, uh, means that the reason that you gave, Mr Goodall, for uh, no increase in unmeritorious claims uh, might not be entirely valid. I mean, the, the, there, are, there are professional ethics as well is, which come into play. You, you know, uh, solicitors, quite apart from the, the economic arguments, solicitors are bound by their professional rules. So um, I don't know exactly what the professional rules would say, but... I think one of the possible impacts of the bill is that firms which have a claims management company, a funding company, will feel they no longer need it. They can fold all those activities within the firm, which is under law society regulation. Um, the law society can always promulgate new practice notes and guidelines as no win, no fee agreements become more, more of a thing in Scotland. Okay, but that uh, suggests more like Mr. Stevenson was suggesting, more stuff after the event. Um, just, I may have missed something. It's a very brief question, Convener, if I may. Uh, and I, I may have missed this in the papers, but what uh, estimates or modelling has been done on the impact uh, of, of the, on the number of claims of this bill? It's, it's impossible to make that estimate. We simply do not know. Um, that again, is, I mean, the, 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 those who wish to offer um, their services under, under these uh, success fee agreements, they may have some estimate, but uh, it's, it's impossible to see. So we don't know the impact of this bill 
on the number of claims? We, there, there's no modelling being done. Well, we no, because you, you cannot know um, how many. How, well, yeah. Best estimates are in the financial memorandum. Thank you, convener. Okay. Um, moving on now, Mary. Thank you, um, Convener. Can I um, ask you about third-party um, funding now? Because in England, there's an emerging market for investors with no direct interest um, to fund a claim for a share of the compensation. And Sheriff um, Principal Taylor has argued that this should be an additional option. And this bill would enable a third-party funder with a financial interest um, in the outcome of the proceedings to be found liable for the winner's expenses if the case was lost. Now, the policy memorandum for the bill refers to commercial third parties being perhaps caught up in this provision, and the financial memorandum suggests that claims management companies um, operating no-win, no-fee arrangements could be caught. Um, now, some of the um, evidence that, that we have um, received has suggested that perhaps trade unions could be caught up in this, or insurers or solicitors who pay an initial fee to get a claim going. Could you perhaps clarify the situation for us? Section 10 on third party funding is intended to only catch uh, commercial third, uh, third party funders. It's not intended to catch um, uh, trade unions or, uh, or, anyone, or trade associations. Um, we are aware that there has been some confusion about whether Section 10 um, should apply to uh, lawyers, and we are intending to um, clarify the section to make it clear. Uh, this is completely separate from qualified one-way cost, cost shifting, so it's not the, the, the two things are completely separate. Sections 8 and 10 in the bill are completely separate. Okay. So it will be made clear later yes. that, that it is only commercial organisations that will yeah. be liable and no yes. one else will be liable? Yes. Okay. Um, does, does the bill not conflate two separate tailor recommendations so on, on liability for expenses and on transparency of funding arrangements? And could you explain how um, qualified one-way cost shifting and third-party um, funding will, will sit together? Um, the, we, we, are in te we think that we will uh, be amending Section 10 to, to separate the two, the two issues on um, disclosure and also liability for expenses, to make that clear. But as I've said, in relation to the third-party funding, mm. that is only intended to be commercial third-party funders and not uh, the lawyers under uh, success fee agreements. So we will need to clarify that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, and moving on, Liam Kemp. Uh, thank you. I just want to briefly look at the auditors of the court. Um, the, uh, there, there, there is a process in place, or there's, there's a proposal to change the uh, employment status of the uh, auditors of the court. Uh, why does the Scottish Government consider that having the auditors employed by the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service is a better guarantor of independence than the uh, self-employment model? Um, the, the auditor of the Court of Session was salaried until around about 1997 or 1998, and the, the, the arrangements were changed at that point. The proposal in the bill is that the auditor of the Court of Session and all other uh, auditors should become salaried members of staff of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. The Gill Review recommended that um, the auditors should all become salaried officials, and that is basically what the bill will do. Um, we are, the argument about, the, the self, about self employment of the auditor of the Court of Session relates to his independence. Now, we think that there is no question that the, in future, even if the auditor of the Court of Session is a member of staff of SCTS, he or she will be independent because, uh, firstly, the SCTS is completely independent of the Scottish Government following the Judiciary and Courts mm -hmm. Scotland Act of 2008. Therefore, the question of independence would only arise in relation to any cases which involved SCTS itself. We understand they are only involved in one or two cases per annum, 
which need not necessarily, of course, go to tax the, the, through the process of taxation of accounts. Um, there is precedent for um, people who are members of staff of bodies taking decisions which affect those bodies. So, for example, uh, planning reporters are employed by the Scottish Government and yet they take decisions which involve, affect the Scottish Government all the time. There's also um, legal precedent on um, the independence. Do you want to say something about that? The other relevant precedent is really all the other officers of court, the clerks and the macers and so on, who are all now employed by the SCTS at arm's length from the Scottish Government. Um, they're all employees, they're subject to freedom of information, ethical standards, data protection, complaints procedures that are standard for civil servants. Um, they're also officers in the Scottish administration, which is a, brings in another layer of governance, including that funds must be paid into the consolidated fund, which is ultimately the parliament's money. To amplify our legal position, you know, we start in the policy memorandum with paragraphs 58 and 59, where the aim is to increase transparency and consistency because Lord Gill identified there were some concerns there which still persist to this day. Um, whilst we want to preserve the fair and adversarial character of the process and the integrity of the process. So there's no intention to depart from the rules of natural justice which are there currently. We recognise that the auditors perform important functions in resolving disputes about expenses in which considerable amounts of money are at stake. And I think quite, well not often, but from time to time, the amount of money involved in expenses is more than the sum in dispute. So really the key legal arguments we've set out in the policy memorandum towards the end um, from paragraph 108 to 110 and we're recognising that not only common law and natural justice, but the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 6, applies to auditing disputes where the principal dispute, say about damages, <coughs> engages Article 6. And we've set out there the case law, um, European and Scottish case law, where we think we're really quite confident that independence can continue to be secured and seem to be secured under the arrangements for the bill. And for those tiny number of cases where the SCTS is a party to taxation, to abandon all of the reforms and leave the self-employment outside of the Scottish administration is, I mean, ultimately it's a policy matter for the Minister, but that would be a departure, we think, from the Gill recommendation. Thank you. Uh, briefly, the policy memorandum at uh, paragraph 70. Uh, it says that transitional arrangements will um, enable current auditors to continue self-employed until their retirement. Uh, do you have any detail yet on what transitional arrangements you intend to put in place to deal with the current share of court auditors? Uh, basically, they will continue in place um, for the time being um, uh, until such time as SCTS um, has sufficient numbers of trained auditors to be able to do all of the work. And of course, it will be open to existing Sheriff Court auditors to apply for posts in SCTS to, to move over to work for them. Thank you. And you say basically, I mean, is that set down anywhere? Is there anywhere that people can go and look to just get that clarity? To get, to get what, sorry, what clarity? To uh, well, they just effectively assure themselves on what you've just said. Is that, is that a written... Uh, well, the, 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 this will be provided for in transitional arrangements made under section 19. Under regulations. One of the quirks about the existing system of auditors is there's not much in the way of a statutory basis for it. So for the Sheriff Corps auditors, they get commissions from the Sheriff Principals, which are only relevant to one sheriffdom. So I'm afraid we can't point you to any legislation for that arrangement, that custom and practice. But the aim in the bill is to produce a new, modern, future-proof, transparent regime in the particular case of the Auditor of the Court of Session, under Section 26 of the Administration of Justice Scotland Act 1933, he has the right to stay in office till he's 65, and we propose to honour that. So the transitional arrangement for the Auditor of the Court of Session is that he enjoys his current statutory rights, and unless and until he retires or resigns, only then would the new system come in. Maurice? That's no, been answered. Thanks, okay, Convener. Thank you. Moving on now, Ben. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good, good morning. 
I uh, want to focus on part four around uh, the group proceedings. Uh, the bill, as you know, doesn't give any detail about how the group proceedings should operate and instead gives the Court of Session the power to, to make the rules covering the issue. And that the Scottish Civil Justice Council will consult with stakeholders how to develop these. It's also notable that the bill doesn't require uh, a person uh, does require, rather, a person to opt in to any procedure. Um, given that some countries allow an opt-out procedure, I'd just be interested if you could detail uh, and explain why the Scottish Government has excluded the possibility of developing an opt-out procedure uh, in this legislation. We, we, in all of the discussions we've had with stakeholders since the beginning of this year, all of them have, have uh, favoured the opt-in procedure because it's thought to be much more straightforward. And since this will be the first time that group proceedings are going to be permitted in Scotland, we thought that uh, we should go for a, a more st straightforward um, model. Mm -hmm. um, the the opt-out uh, procedure would be much more complicated because what it involves is that the, the court itself has to decide what the what the group is going to be, define the, the boundaries of the group. And inevitably that means there are going to be some people would be included within the group who actually have not taken any decision and, and may be completely ignorant of the fact that they are now part of group proceedings. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems much fairer if you require people to actually opt into the procedure. And so, as I say, all of the stakeholders we've spoken to this year have agreed with that view. I would just add that the Law Commission, which did detailed work in the 1990s, it's the culmination of that was a draft set of court rules which provided for opt-in procedure. Mm -hmm. OK, thank, thank you for that. So it's, it's, it's purely on a practical basis. And I, mean, I, I can think of a, a group in my constituency who are interested in this legislation mm -hmm. and certainly know that they would want to, to opt-in. So that, that's interesting to get that clarity. Um, is there, are there any specific plans to revisit this in the future or the issue of opt-out or are we, are we on a, a course of just opt-in as, as things well, stand? never say never, um, but I think the, 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 the intention would be that um, we would uh, have the opt-in procedure bedded in and let it operate for a few years before there would be any consideration of trying the other, the other system. Okay, um, thank you. And, and, and just a number of other practical points, particularly on, on this uh, section of the legislation. Would you be able to explain how the Scottish Government expects that group proceedings will be funded? Um, group proceedings could be funded under success fee agreements or they could be legally aided. Although the regulations, we think, will need to, uh, will need to be amended. The, le the legal aid regulations? Yeah. Thank you. And just lastly, Convener, um, could you explain whether the, the Scottish Government has considered issues such as how an adverse award of expenses might be enforced against a group and uh, how disputes about the distribution of compensation between group members might be dealt with? I think these would all be issues um, for um, uh, rules of court, although some of those issues may be things that would be um, considered in the, the document which sets up the scheme, which is the, the group proceedings. So there would be something in that agreement between the parties as to how the, um, the damages will be distributed. So it would be for uh, private decisions effectively private between decision, yeah. the parties yeah. involved. Okay, thank you for that insight. That concludes our, our questioning. That's been a very helpful and detailed session, um, and I hope you find it helpful as well. Um, we're now to suspend and um, to allow the officials to leave and move into private session. Uh, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 12th of September, 2017.